Hello my friends, John LaRufa here with another Straight Up Solo. And in this episode, we're going to take a look at Jerusalem, Anno Domini. We're going to look at it from a solo perspective. And in this game, the solo mode plays drastically different than the three and four player mode. It's similar, I guess, to the two player mode. So let's go ahead and see what it looks like as we demonstrate the game. Okay, and as usual, folks, please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. And if you have, I really appreciate the support. Thank you so much. So, what's going on in this game? <laughs> this game is a very elaborate, puzzly game about trying to move your disciples as close as possible to either Jesus himself or the apostles at the table of the Last Supper. And you're doing that by basically getting your disciples out of your camp, moving into locations, and eventually transferring them over to the upper room where they can enjoy the uh, the feast and the company of, well, the esteemed blessed Lord, um, so and his apostles. So how do you do that? Well, you're doing that through this intricate use of these cards. And the cards have a couple things going on. First of all, they have this location symbol. When you play the card, you can take the action on the location. And then you can take the follower action, depending on what it says here. But also, as you lay down the cards, you're trying to make a set of exactly these three symbols, no more, no less, and in this order, in order to basically visit an apostle. And when you visit an apostle, you get to place that apostle at the table in a specific location that's advantageous to you, take their bonus action, and also um, score the cards that you have been playing down here, which is a lot of points for those those uh, set of three cards, you know, so it's a big swing of points when you do that. You also, um, at that point, will like clear off your board for that one set of cards and move open up spaces to do more of it. The other thing you're trying to do in this game is balance your resources with placing your disciples on this board. And so to get resources, you, when you play a card, you look at the number of disciples you have in these different regions and you get one resource per disciple that you have. So it is good, you can have a maximum of three disciples here. It is good to have as many as you can here, but every time you're moving a disciple to, well, the Last Supper, just to basically prepare for the end game, the scoring, you're having to both spend resources to get there, as well as deplete your resource engine by moving them. So there's some tension there. You're also able to upgrade the deck of cards you have. You have this basic deck of 20 cards in the solo player which combines the one and two player decks together, um, I guess you should say the two two player decks together, into a larger deck of standard cards. And you, you will have five of those per um, turn, no matter what, no more, no less. But you can, you can get these cards, which are better by buying them for either two coins at the kind of the, the middle to end point of the turn, or you can go to the, the market and buy them as many as you want for one coin a piece. Or you can get these uh, 33 AD cards by landing on these spots over here. And these are really good. They have three follower actions on them. There's also a way to listen to parables. And that is basically like a set collection. And you can do that through some card play. But mostly be when you put your disciples on these icons right here, you will get to listen to a parable. The requirements of the parables are you have to go in order from one all the way up to seven. And you can't listen to a parable at a higher number than you have people in the Last Supper upper room. So you can't just like, focus on that completely um, and ignore everything else. You kind of have to do stuff out there. In your area here, um, you basically have a couple of reminders, your spots where you can play the cards, the spots where the parables go. But then you have this little warehouse, which can get clogged up pretty easily. So this provides some... Um, kind of tension and thought about how you're going to handle this. Because every time you gain resources, they have to fit in this spot at the end of your turn. And you have your disciples that have to fit in this spot. And every time you put a disciple out here, you can, if you want, take one of these favor tokens, which is worth one point at the end of the game. But once you place it down, it stays in your warehouse and you can never uh, remove it. So yeah, it's good to have those favor tokens for extra points. But as you're doing that, you're constricting your warehouse and constricting your flow. 
Um, so that's kind of the overview of what's going on. Now, when you're playing solo, you're playing against Barabbas, and Barabbas is trying to, of course, foil, foil your plans so that he can escape and not be, uh, you know, condemned. Um, and he does that through a deck of cards, and Barabbas is actually fairly easy to uh, manage. You flip over the card, you do what the card says top to bottom, that's it. There's no special intricacies. Um, the only thing is you have to kind of just learn the icons, but the icons are very well explained here, at least what they are. And once you learn the rules, it's it's fairly simple to understand what's going on here. I find myself looking at the rules a little bit just to get clarification, but uh, it's it's a decent situation in that regard. There are some slight ambiguities, which people have pointed out, which I agree with, with regards to if I have to move one of these these neutral followers, is there a dumb idea, like would there be a dumb space for him to move it, etc., and stuff like that? Um, and and so basically, with those, it's straightforward in some of those things what the rules say. But there are fringe cases where I think you just use your best judgment. Um, but regardless, that's what's going on there. Uh, finally, each of these apostles, when you place them, will do something special. Not only do they figure out how their points are going to score in the row. For instance, I've got uh, Matthew here. And if the game ends like this, this disciple's going to get six, which is me. This one gets five. This one gets four. And so they're one point less as they go away from the disciples. And, of course, the people at the foot of Jesus and the head of Jesus are going to get seven, six, five, and four like that. There is uh, Judas over here, and everybody in Judas's row will get negative points. So he will get negative five. Whoever's there is going to get negative four, negative three. Um, and then the other the other rows are the, uh, the orange starts at five, the purple starts at four. Additionally, when you place a white um, apostle, you allow, are allowed to swap the place of two different uh, people. And so that is really cool because you can swap a low place for a high place and put that into your strategy. When you place an orange, you get to immediately score the points of the whole row that's in there. And when you place a purple, you get to bring someone from here to the Last Supper for free and not have to pay any of the reward or the uh, costs to do so. Okay, so that's about the size of it. Now, the flying the ointment is as the game progresses, you're going to be moving this Sanhedrin, this crown of thorns tile up, and the Sanhedrin is going to start messing with the plans. And what the Sanhedrin will do is basically um, eject people from the upper room, and that can be a bunch of these neutral followers right here which there's a lot, been a lot of them ejected already, or it can be your followers. Barabbas uh, is in cahoots with them, of course, so he doesn't go anywhere. And you don't exactly know where or how they're going to strike. So some of them, like for instance, this one removes all the ones in the, that were in this upper right quadrant. Uh, but there's also lines and other things. And because you don't know, two of the tiles in the game are not used in any game, you really can't be sure of what's coming up. So you've got to you kind of get an idea of maybe this place is safe, but you don't know for sure after it's been revealed. So there's a little bit of stuff there. All right, let me play a couple turns for you, and then you'll kind of see how this game flows. So it is my turn right now, and I have my five cards, and the five cards are these right here, as you can see. So there's a lot of choices to make in this specific situation. You have to figure out Am I going to start a new set of three? Am I going to add on to a set of three? Or am I going to put it in just this junk pile here that I'll hopefully be able to get to rearrange depending on if I get some um, rearrangement icons later on, depending on the cards, depending on where you place them, etc. And so I've really been trying to focus on being the one to place the apostles in this game, if at all possible. So I want to try to play a card in this spot that would contribute to that, or in this spot that would contribute. And because I'm over here, I've got this menorah one for the temple already played down. I can play my temple card, or I'm sorry, my market card right here. And with that, that will be two of the three that I need to get going. So I'm going to do that. And when I play that, I get to go to the market action. And I have $3 that I can spend. So I have a stone and a bread. And I'm trying to look to see where would I be best off getting some resources here to help me actually be able to afford to place any of these down with my three coins. In this case, it would be nice to be able to put something right here. And the reason I say that is because that would be able to get a good card. So I will I will buy for the cost of two denarii 
one of the stones and put it in my warehouse, okay? Um, so there, and I have one coin left. I can, if I didn't buy or sell resources, I could buy up these cards, but I don't, I did buy and sell resources. So that's not going to happen. So then I move to the next step, which would be um, going to my follower actions down here. Now this says place a friendly follower. So placing a friendly follower means if I had access to one of these neutral followers by previously placing one of my followers on the board and pushing them off, I could put them down. When I put them down, this is unique to the one or two player game. If you make a grouping like this, you get one point per follower in that group. So in my previous turn, I scored five points by putting this group together. It was quite nice. And so that's one way that you can score points in this uh, one and two player mode specific to that, okay? Because the three and four player mode use this intricate um, special follower type action where you're giving these favor tokens, not follower, but a favor token. And, and that allows you to do some other things, which doesn't make sense in a one or two player game. So it's a little bit different here. Okay, so anyway, I'm not going to be doing that because I don't have any of them. But it says I could go to the temple area if I wanted. And I do want, I want to spend my last denarii and I want to put one of my disciples out here so that next time I play a desert card, I can get three bread, which will be helpful, okay? You can only have a maximum of three out in the spot. All right, so that is now my follower actions. And the next thing would be if I had a set of three, I could visit an apostle. I don't have a set of three. Then it says purchase a Mahan, uh, Mahan card for two coins, two denarii. I don't have that. So finally, I'm just going to refill my hand by drawing this card right here. And as you can see, I drew one that allows for a temple action, getting a fish, and then again, um, moving a friendly follower, which is actually pretty good. I'll show you why that's good in a second. And I'll probably end up playing that card next. Either way, let's do a Barabbas card. So it's his turn. He's going to get one point for every follower he has in these two regions. So that's five points. All right, so we're bumping him right up. Then he's going to place one of his followers of the place that he has the most. And that is a rule. You can only place from the spot that you have the most. If there's a tie, you get to choose. But here, um, I think you get to choose. I don't think you have to go top to bottom. He has to go top to bottom. But for you, I think you choose. Anyway, so he's going to place it. And it says in this row right here, and there's only one empty space. So there we go. He's over there. His turn's done. As you can see, pretty simple to... Um, deal with. He doesn't deal with coins. He doesn't deal with resources. The only thing he does is play cards, place people, and uh, he will get parable tiles. Okay, so back to me now. And I talked about that card that I liked, and I'm going to use it because I want to place this follower. So I'm going to put down this menorah card again, um, and that one would let me go to the temple. But I don't have any coins to spend, so that does not help me. However, I do want to take the fish. I've got room in my resource or my warehouse for it. And then I'm going to move a follower. I'm going to move this friendly follower over here so I can score a whopping six points because this whole group, four, five, six, is all grouped together, and it's very nice. I'm definitely going to do that, score a bunch of points like that. So that's one of the little puzzles out here. When you have your these neutral followers that are on the board, group them up as best you can to try to score those points before the Sanhedrin removes them. So I've done that. Again, I don't have um, the sets that I need and I don't have any money, so my turn's over and I draw a card. Drawing a Barabbas card now, he's gonna get one point for each of the people that he has in these regions, so that's four. One, two, three, four. And then he's gonna place one of his followers, in this case here, he's gonna bring him to the, um, the feast right here into the upper room. He's gonna place him right here. And this is gonna let him get a parable tile. So he's going to take that one before I can get it. That scores him one point immediately. There we go. And then he also gets another parable tile because he placed it on the reward and he also gets this, um, this next one. So he's going to get that and that's going to score him another point. Okay. All right, back to me now. So I need a desert card if I'm going to be able to complete this situation. There is a desert card up there, but I need two coins to get it. So is there any way I can get some coins? I don't have a market card, so I'm kind of stuck in that regard. So instead, let's focus on trying to place some people at the Last Supper. And what would be nice is to be able to put one out here if I had three stone. So I'm going to play this card right here, which allows me to get a stone first. I'm going to put it in my, my kind of junk area. And I'm going to get that stone. Okay. And then 
I'm going to place a follower that's out here. I'm going to take this one from here because I have to take it from the spot that's got the most. And I'm going to put it down on the stone and stone spot right here. And that will help me kind of solidify my spot in there. That's three stone I have to pay. Plus, I covered a denarii space so I can get one of those coins. And, and if I can keep getting coins, maybe I'll help myself get that desert card. All right, no visiting the apostles yet. And we go ahead and uh, draw the card. Back to Barabbas now. Barabbas is going to score. He keeps scoring these. So he's going to score one point for those against. It's four more points. Look here. All right, and then he places a follower. In this case, this one. Up to the top, okay, that whole roll is full, so he's going to place over here. I'm playing it, and I think it does say this in the rules, that, oh, I'm sorry, I looked at that wrong. This is the top row, so he's up here. You do have to notice where the little, the little notch is, because that top notch refers to this, where the bottom notch refers to that. So kind of pay attention to that subtlety there. All right, so he's up there, um, and that's unfortunate. That's a scoring spot, so... I don't like that, but it happens. Okay, back to me now. Still want the desert card. What could I do to try to get the desert card? It would be nice to do some more uh, stuff on the market, but that does not look like it's going to happen. Now, um, that's kind of a slow boat situation there. I'm just looking at what's available. So a fish, I have a fish and a bread. Fish and a bread would allow me to do a reorganization. A reorganization would help because there that would get me my desert card. So why don't I do that? Even though there's nobody out here, I do like that reorganization situation. So let's go ahead and make sure that we can do one that places a follower. And I'll do this one here. That gives me a stone, another stone, because I'm going to this spot for one. And then I get a fish because it's on the card, and then I get to place a follower. I'm sorry, that's move a friendly follower, darn. Um, I think that's worth it because I'm going to still be able to stack this up. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to clog this thing. And now it's worth one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll take the seven points. Sure thing. All right. So I'll kind of delay my turn for what I was going to do till next time. Maybe I'll draw a desert anyway. Here we go. And a desert. Ooh, that was lucky. All right. Very lucky indeed. So we're going to go ahead and flip him. Now he scores one. Two, three. Two, th three points for those followers up there. So that puts him over here. And then he's going to place a follower um, from this spot to the upper spot here where there is none. So then I've always been playing it. If you go like this and there's full, then you go over and you just kind of keep following around in the logical order. And I think it does specify that in the rules. Then he moves the Sanhedrin or it's the um, Crown of Thorns up again. In this case, now we see what happens. Okay, so all of the spots in the X, X's get wiped out. That means all of this. So I'm glad I took advantage of it when I could because so long, unfortunately, the Sanhedrin is taking them off the board. Then you place a white uh, apostle in this case, starting with the first empty seat over here and going around. So that means Philip is going to land right there. And that's how those Sanhedrin tiles work. Okay, back to me. Now let's go ahead and demonstrate. So that shows that, which is good. I wanted you guys to see that. Now we're going to play this card because I really want to get the, the place in the apostle mechanism demonstrated before I uh, move on to the review here. So I get two bread for being in the desert, which is great. So I need those. Then I get another bread. And then I can place one of my disciples, which I will, and I'm going to put this disciple in a spot that makes the most sense for what I'm going to try to do here. And so I have a bread and a stone, bread and stone or fish and, fish and bread. So I can go, like I said, I want to do that reorg, but now that I've got the re, I don't need the reorg right now. Actually, this makes the most sense. Oh, that's a Sanhedrin one. Yeah. Hmm. I would rather do something different if at all possible. And maybe the best thing to do would be, see, those are all parable ones, which are nice. Here we go. So we're going to do this. We're going to do the fish and the stone. That gets me a parable card, so that'll help me with my set collection. Because the more parables you have at the end of the game, the more you're going to get. 
And even though this one's worth zero at this point, still glad to get it to try to ramp this up. Okay, so now that I've done the follower actions, now I can go ahead and I can visit um, an apostle. I'm going to do that. This three icon section right here allows me to visit one of these apostles in the center. And so I'm going to visit him. And um, yeah, that didn't exactly work out the way I was hoping because I didn't have the right resources, but that's okay. We'll just do it anyway. Um, I'm going to place him over here and that is going to allow him to score immediately this row. And this row is populated by just me. So that's going to be not five, not four, but three points. It probably could have been better folks, but I kind of wanted to demonstrate it. Then I get all these points in the upper right-hand corner. So that is another nine points right there, which is very good. So I'm going to go ahead and pull into that spot right there. And then you take any cards that came from your hand, discard them, any cards that came from the Mahan deck, and put them in there on the bottom. And any cards that came from this would go to the bottom of that deck. Okay. So we visited the Apostle, he scored, um, he did the, we scored the Apostle points, then we cleaned that up, which I just did. Then if I had two coins, I'd be able to buy a card. I haven't been pretty short of money for a bit. And then you clean up your player board, which means that you have to make sure you have room for everything and draw your card. Or, I'm sorry, that's, that's part of the other thing, the refill the hand, pardon me. Oh good, I got a Markets, that'll help me there. So you get the feel, I think, of how this game is playing out. The way it ends is, if this gets to the top, it ends immediately, okay? Also, if all the apostles go onto the board, then this starts to move at the beginning of every person's turn and just ramps up really fast. The game will end immediately if you manage to put all of your disciples onto the uh, Last Supper board. Then if you get them all up in the upper room, then it ends immediately at that point. And then you score basically for these points right here, and I don't believe there's any, and if you have this right here, if you didn't use this tile, this tile lets you use the power of one of the apostles for a second time. Um, so for instance, if I want to do that on my next turn, and maybe I'll just demonstrate that, I could move this, these two, I could swap these two, for instance, uh, which might be helpful. Uh, so anyway, so let's just do one more turn here. Barabbas, Barabbas is going to score in this case for um, here and here. That'll give him two points. Then he is going to place his follower here. He's going to place him in this section. Oh, good. That's right where the negatives are. I like that. And then he's going to get yet another parable. All right. And that puts there. Okay, so my turn. So I will use this, right? So it, I'm, I'm sacrificing five points to basically get seven. And instead of that, maybe the best thing to do would be to change it up even more. So I'm going to move this guy and swap him with this guy so he's going to go in the back so that'll be worth three and then i'll be over here so oops so that'll at least be worth six so it's kind of a swing point situation so i maximize the sacrifice of that and that's my entire turn out of the game does not score you know you flip it over or whatever you want to do but it's it's gone okay so it will go back and forth until the game ends and whoever wins would win in the case of this game though there is a winning condition not only do you have to beat Barabbas, but I think you have to score at least 150 points. And I know there is a solitaire campaign that ramps up the challenges. The first game is you got to score 150 points or more and beat Barabbas. But the next, um, basically they keep adding these difficulty uh, levels to this campaign and they make it so that you can kind of try again if you need to. And if you don't, then you fall down and you lose the campaign, but you can keep the parables going back and forth. So there's some cool stuff there to explore also. All right, let me tell you what I think of the thing. All right, so there you have it. That is the solo mode of this game. And I've got to say, it's pretty interesting. There's a lot going on and there are a lot of difficult decisions to make with regards to the card play, the resource gathering, what happens after you get cleaned out by the Sanhedrin tiles, how Barabbas scores points, moving around the followers that are, are not yours, but just to you know score those big bunches of points there. It all seems very important. And it's I think it's a lot of fun. I think the puzzle aspect here is huge. Um, that being said, I don't know if it's super novel. I mean, the I, first of all, I'll say this. 
The theme is, is masterfully done. It's done well because everything you're doing here makes sense uh, from a standpoint of the prestige that you'd have at the Last Supper, right? You'd want to get close to Jesus or his apostles. I mean, in those days, that's exactly what people wanted to do, be seated at a dinner of in a place of importance. So that makes a ton of sense. And I think that the designers did a fantastic job incorporating this theme into a board game without being, you know, preachy, without being um, watering it down, without trying to push any kind of agenda. I think it was great. And of course, I am a Catholic, so it does not offend me one bit. I play plenty of games of lots of different themes. And there are some themes that I won't want to play because I don't, I don't particularly like the ideas there in some cases. But for the most part, I'm a pretty universal gamer with regards to things. However, I wouldn't want to play a game that was offensive to my faith. I don't find this offensive at all. And for people who aren't um, you know, Catholic or Christian or whatever else, this game could be absolutely played just as a game. There is nothing in particular here that would evoke, you know, you saying, I got to avoid this because of whatever situation. You could skip all of the flavor text in the, in the instructions if you didn't want to read those biblical passages. However, I kind of think it's pretty interesting how they wove the biblical passages into the uh, mechanics as well to kind of provide some background and flavor and it was just really cool. I like that. Uh, so, so back to the gameplay itself. I do think that there's a lot of uncertainty in this solo mode, which provides the tension. You don't know what is going to happen with Barabbas, where he's going to put his followers, what the Sanhedrin tiles are going to do to your followers, your disciples. And I think that's really cool. I did not find that this game dragged on. It was done in an hour. It was a reasonable situation in that regard. Um, and there were a lot of conflicting things that I wanted to do, but didn't have the right setup. So I had to kind of delay and work to try to get some different resources, different money. And, and it puts a lot of things in there to have pleasant roadblocks to making it just as straightforward. Of course, I got to go close to everybody. That's, I mean, yes, that's obvious, but to accomplish that is a whole different story. So I thought that was really good and I enjoyed it. I think that the the constraints of what you're doing with your card tableaus are also good. The constraint in the warehouse is good. I just like all that. And the, even the set collection with the parable, uh, parables can, you know, gain a lot of points. That being said, I did beat Barabbas in my first attempt um, by a decent margin. And so I think that from a standpoint of repeated plays, I'm really happy that they put that campaign in there. Because I'm going to guess that without some of those conditions for winning and such and so forth, it's going to be a fairly easy, I'd say an easier experience to beat Barabbas. Now, I didn't achieve the 150. I ended up with 137. So I'm glad about that. Because it was my first game and I achieved the 150. I'm saying, okay, well, that bar is not set very high. So I fell short of where I needed to be. I was also surprised by the end of the game. The, the game ended when Barabbas placed his last disciple, and I really didn't kind of see that coming, although now I know what to look for. But um, I, was, I had big plans. I had other things, and I left a lot of points on the table because I didn't get my disciples to the table, so to speak. So anyway, I enjoyed the experience. I'm looking forward to trying out the campaign. I'm looking forward to seeing how they put different other different roadblocks in there and how the puzzle kind of, you know, tightens up on me to, to make me think and be more efficient. Ultimately speaking, there's plenty of things to consider here, and I think it's a very fun game to play. That being said, if you don't like uncertainty, you're going to be really frustrated with how the Sanhedrin tiles potentially could wipe you out with a lot of plans. And so, you know, you have to build that into your strategy. Uh, if you double down in a quadrant or a row or something like that, you might be making it risky for yourself to see that happen. My game ended early, so as I interpret the rules and I've asked for clarification, the last two of the six Sanhedrin tiles were not revealed. I don't know if they should be revealed if you just flip them over no matter what, um, because the rules are ambiguous. It says that once the last um, the last disciple of either player gets down the, the Crown of Thorns track, automatic, or, uh, marker automatically advances to the end of the Sanhedrin track, and I don't know if that means that on the way I have to flip all those and deal with them or not. Not really sure. Um, that will definitely change things if that is the case, because then you have no time to react 
to that. And that could be, I would say that's a little bit more frustrating. So we'll see what other people come back with eventually. Either way, I found it a very enjoyable experience. If you like puzzly kind of games uh, with some intricate, interesting card play and some constrained moves and lots of things to consider, this is a good one for you. If you're looking for something that has really meaty um, like production chains or meaty actions or huge combos or things like that. This game doesn't have that. It also has a lot of that uncertainty like I was talking about. So be aware of that in the solo mode. That's what I'm thinking about it. So I hope this was informative. I hope it helps you to understand uh, how the game kind of flows as a solo mode and if it's for you or not. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the support and whatever you decide to play in the future. I hope you have a fantastic time doing it. Take it easy, everybody.